Yes, you did. <laughs> okay, so we've got, uh, oh, it's uh, 1.30. Um, so I guess we'll just get started. How's that sound, Diane? Sounds good. Okay. Um, I'm Pat LaMarche, and uh, this is a production of the Charles Bruce Foundation, which is an organization, a 501c3 in the United States that uh, supports writers, artists, musicians, wham, and a lot of other uh, people who work in the arts or have something to do with the arts, the performing arts. Um, and uh, they're this very supportive organization of some of the podcasts we've done over on our other page, Still Left Out in America. We'll, we'll put this uh, a tape of this video up there. If you're watching on YouTube, welcome YouTube. Um, we are on Facebook. And uh, we've got an exciting program because today is September 11th, 2021. And uh, you know, the, the amount of content out there right now is mind boggling. I, if you're at YouTube to get to this channel, then you probably had to weed through a thousand little video clips of people commemorating 9-11. And um, in some ways it, 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 it begs you to not do it, but in other ways it begs you to chime in also. And I'm really honored today because I'm being joined by Diane Davis who if you've been lucky enough to go to Broadway before the pandemic and now Broadway's coming back to life, but you might've seen uh, the play Come From Away, which is um, basically an, a, a stage adaptation of what really happened on September 11th, 2001, when airspace over the United States was closed and a whole pile of airplanes that were supposed to go to the United States just couldn't get there. Um, and they had to land in other places, and many of them landed in Gander, Newfoundland. And, uh, you know, it was a different day for the folks in Gander than what they were used to. Um, so if you see the play, you'll notice this amazing leading woman, and she's <laughs> she's vivacious and energetic, and she's got and a... Saucy. She's really saucy. Saucy. <laughs> was that a criteria for picking her? I, I blame that on the Beulah side of the character. <laughs> The Beulah side is saucy. You're pretty saucy, Diane. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about that um, and, and how that play came about, how Diane Davis and the other people at Gander ra rallied together as a community to expand exponentially over their normal size to include all the people who couldn't go home. Um, when the uh, World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and then, of course, the, the crash in Shanksville, Pennsylvania happened when uh, four planes that were destined for a normal landing ended up, well, landing in history. They landed in the history books and, and all the attendant things that happened after that. Um, I'm just Real quickly, I'm just gonna do my own personal, uh, we're all sort of vomiting forth what happened to us that day. Uh, September 11th, 2001, I was live broadcasting live on WEBB radio in Augusta, Maine. Um, we, uh, was, it, we were just about to get off the air. It was 10 minutes of nine. Uh, East, East Coast time, and if it had been 10 minutes after nine, the station would have been automated. So the difference in the amount of time, whether there were live broadcasters to accept it or not, the time difference was the fact that uh, there were a whole pile of live disc jockeys still on the air at the time. I was in the studio, the phone rang, we played a song, answered the phone, and someone said, a small plane has just flown into the World Trade Center. And a student of history, I knew that Many decades earlier, a small plane had flown into the Empire State Building. The Empire State Building with, withstood the impact, still there today. So I thought, oh, that's interesting. Um, I ran, ran, turned on the television and saw t the first tower burning with the plane having hit it. And I thought, that's no small plane. <laughs> you know, I'd just been, my, my best friend also on the radio station at the time, uh, Renee Nelson from, um, 92 Moose, which was our sister station, she and I had been at the top of the World Trade Center a couple of months earlier trying to talk the go-go girls into letting us dance in their cages. <laughs> we you know, had just been there at Windows on the World. So we knew how huge it was. So Renee and I and my co-host Randy had to get back on the air one more time and we watched as the second plane hit the towers. And that's when we knew this was no accident. It was nothing like what happened decades earlier. And it's the first and only time in my broadcasting career when the emergency broadcast system kicked in. Um, and the United States has a system where the emergency broadcast system basically can just take over the airwaves. Uh, and 
uh, cut in. We got directives immediately from our home offices because we were a huge corporation that said, stay on the air, stop playing music. So we were a music station and we went on the air, we turned into talk radio, we stayed on the air, we took people's phone calls and then the Pentagon happened and Shanksville happened and we broadcast live basically for about five days. Um, people were aghast. They were in mourning. They wanted to do something. They wanted to be there. They wanted to be a part of it and they couldn't. So I said to my co-host, I'm taking the radio station van and I'm gonna go see these people out in the street. So we had a five gallon pickle bucket I threw the pickle bucket in the van and I started driving. People would call into the radio station and say, my on-air name was Jenny Judge. Send Jenny to, to see me. I'd drive to them and it would be a second grade teacher who said, we just passed a, a hat in my second grade classroom and they'd, they'd dump their ch change and quarters and everything into it. Um, I went to another place where there'd be people who some people would say, I just want to hug you. And I'd get out of the van and I'd be hugging people. Every, people just wanted somebody to tell them it was going to be okay. Um, at one point, after about the third day of my driving around the state of Maine, collecting money in my pickle bucket and saying, hey, I just got $257 for the pickle bucket, trying to you know, be enthusiastic and making me, people feel like they were part of things, a state trooper started following me. So I'm broadcasting live. I pull over with the state trooper behind me. He walks up to the side of the van and he says, I heard you have a bucket full of money in your van. And I said, is that illegal? He said, no, <laughs> you nama, nama is a word in Maine. You're broadcasting that you have a bucket full of money as you drive around town. And I hear people say, come see me. How do you know someone's not gonna say, come see me and steal your stinking bucket? <laughs> and I thought, because they're not gonna do that to me. And I never thought someone would steal my bucket. But for the next two days, this little state trooper, big state trooper, followed me on my little escapades all through the state of Maine collecting money. And at the end of the week, the people of central Maine had put $80,000 in that pickle bucket because there was a burden of camaraderie that we all felt. There was a burden of participation we all felt. We, we needed to repair this. We needed, we had a collective um, sorrow and understanding that we needed to be a part of the solution because the agony of what actually happened on 9-11 was so terrible. And the only thing you can do when something terrible happens is try to make it better. And that's my segue to you, Diane, where all of these planes start landing. So if you don't know how planes come from Europe to the United States, the, uh, the shortest distance on a globe is an arc. For those of you who aren't doing math at home, the shortest distance on a plane is a straight line, but the shortest distance on the globe is an arc. So people, so the planes arc up over the Northern hemisphere and down into the United States, and they arc over Gander, Newfoundland. And so tell us what your day was like, Diane. How did this day begin for you? Um, for anyone who's seen the musical, you might want to go out and get a cup of coffee or something because it's pretty accurate. Uh, September 11th, 2001 was actually the second week of school at Gander Academy and our support staff was on strike. That meant we had no secretary, no bus drivers, no janitors, and the parents were responsible to bring the kids in at a designated time. They were given a window of time. Of course that didn't work. They were bringing their kids in whatever way was convenient for them to get to work or to get to the Tim Hortons line or whatever. So you're trying to do attendance and another child shows up and you're trying to do attendance and another child shows up and then you hear one out in the hallway and you wonder if that's the missing one. And so it's, it, you know, it's just a little extra craziness to the beginning of the year when you're trying to set routine and trying to get to know the children. I was teaching grade three French immersion at the time. 
Uh, a little bit after 10, I looked out in the hallway again just to see if there was any more stragglers coming in. And a mum came down the hallway and said, a plane just hit the World Trade Center. I'm here to get my son. And I saw that as two separate statements. And the thoughts through my head were um, a terrible accident. And I wonder why she sent him to school for only an hour if she was going to come and pick him up. And uh, a few minutes later, a second mom came down the hallway and she was very intense. And she said, the second plane just hit in New York. I want my kids now. And that was when we knew something had happened. It was 20 years ago in a primary and elementary school. We had no televisions in the classroom. Oh, someone's crashing my Zoom. We had no televisions in the classroom. We had no, um, he's, he's 17 months old and he just loves it. Oh, hello. hello. We had, Welcome. We'll, we'll just, he'll go off in a little while. He'll get bored. So we had also no cell phones. And really, even if we'd had televisions, it wouldn't have been appropriate to turn them on with kids in the school because we didn't know what we were dealing with. A couple of my colleagues did have cell phones. One was married to a police officer and the other was married to an air traffic controller. Mm. So they um, were immediately starting to get information from their spouses. We knew there were planes in the ground. We knew something had happened in New York. We knew, we heard that all the hotel rooms had been booked. And um, so all, you mean all the hotel rooms on Gander? Yes, yes. Booked. Someone okay. had booked all the hotel rooms. And then at our lunch hour, we came home for lunch, which is a walk across the road for me. I live across the road from the school. And um, we watched, we turned the TV on and saw it for the first time and watched the second tower fall live. And we had lunch, I guess, and went back to work. And all of the kids showed up. Most of the kids showed up again in the afternoon, again, depending on parents picking them up, um, and went back into the classroom. So the afternoon was spent um, keeping people calm. Probably a lot of what you were doing on your phone calls when you were on the radio, uh, reassuring people. For me, with my children, they're eight years old. I was trying to explain to them, they're talking about the news, and I said, it looks like news and we know it's terrible and we know people have to have died, but we can't quite call it the news yet until we know more about it. We know what the facts are about it. It's my critical literacy background. And um, so I tried to reassure them by telling them that it was far away mm -hmm. and that it was in New York. And I don't even know if I was aware of the other crashes at that point. And they, being aviation town kids, said, but madame, you can refuel a plane in the air. So they had an awareness and they had a concern for their own safety in, at eight years old. So I talked to them about it and reassured them a bit. And the whole afternoon was also sticking your head out the door and making eye contact with other teachers and checking in with them. Are they okay? Sometimes somebody would have heard something. And, and so this was just a whole afternoon of not getting my reading assessments done, keeping people calm, very hot day in the classroom. And eventually at the end of the day, an announcement was made for the children to take home their personal belongings. You're going to go? Good job. You're such a good fella. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, he might hang out. He's not sure yet. Um, so we, uh, the children were told to take their personal belongings home. And they got a little bit panicked about that. And I explained to them that, just like a fire drill, the town would have an emergency plan. And that part of the emergency plan might be to use the school. And um, so the good reason to get all your personal items out of it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And the thought that someone might sleep in their classroom, they thought was hilarious. So that kind of broke the tension a bit for them. Mm -hmm. So the kids went home. And it, during that afternoon, one of my colleagues, Nicole, came to me 
and asked if I could coordinate the staff, maybe make sandwiches or, you know, provide food. She said, there's going to be a lot of people and they're probably going to need help. And her husband was a police officer. So I've still, 20 years later, never asked, where did that come from? Was that you? Was that him? We did we think of it ourselves? And um, so I went to the office, offered to be the point person. I was the head of the social committee at the time. So I was used to doing this, coordinating staff if something happened. And um, got a staff list, went to the town hall and registered. And they had a table inside the door and you couldn't get past those two secretaries. There was nobody getting in the building. They did not need the people of Gander com coming in to tell them what to do. So I registered, said I had 60 names in my pocket that they were the staff of Gander Academy and I felt I could count on half of them, at least. So went home and then watched it in earnest on television, had something to eat and drove up around the airport. And all of the aircraft were still on the tarmac on the runways and we had 38 passenger aircraft. So and as this day while you're at school, aircraft are just landing yeah. and getting- And they land, they land it very quickly because it was any aircraft that was to the west of the mid-Atlantic. So they would have only had two hours to get to Gander. Right. So if someone just took off and wasn't to the mid-Atlantic, they would go back. Uh -huh. So these were the aircraft that were to the mid-Atlantic, but there were also aircraft that landed in Gander that had been preparing to touch down. We're minutes away from landing in New York City. And they we're would diverted, and and they diverted would to Gander. Yeah. So the aircraft were still on the tarmac at, at supper time and we were able to drive by and this is my biggest fan. <laughs> um, One of them. Yeah. <laughs> and we were able to drive by and see the aircraft on the tarmac, the, on the, the runway. It ran uh, perpendicular to the road we were on. And from that perspective, I realize now it was the perspective. It looked like the wingtips were coming and that there were smaller aircraft tucked in underneath. Wow. But that was the perspective. Oh, when you look at the aerial photo, you can see how closely these aircraft were parked to each other. So this they is, still had people inside them? Yes. Oh my the God. doors were open. The, all of the passengers were still on board and police cars were circulating around the aircraft. And there was bumper to bumper traffic going down this road uh, near the airport. We weren't allowed up to the airport, but there was one road that went down past the bottom of this runway, which has since been landscaped. You can't see down that runway anymore. That's one of the safety measures that changed because of September 11th. So I looked at my husband and I said, I got to go back to the town hall. I don't know what I thought I could do, but I went back and I walked in. And as I walked in, someone came down over the stairs and he said, we need eight people to go to the high school and stack furniture so that people can sleep on the floors. I said, I can do that. So they looked at each other with two knowing looks. She can do that. She has the skills. If we don't give her a job, she's going to keep coming back. <laughs> right? Because they knew me. Right. So they said eight people, no more. I phoned um, six coworkers. And Brayden's mom was living with us at the time, going to college, and picked her up. And when we got to the school, there were 20 of us. Wow. Because everyone phoned someone and said, I got a job. As we stacked furniture, we thought about um, computers. And re initially, we were moving them. And then we realized, no, some people might be able to use them. Again, 20 years ago, most people did not have email. If they did have email, they wouldn't have known how to use it outside of work. There are a few pictures around of laptops on top of desks at Gander Academy which is kind of funny to look at because there was no Wi-Fi. So these were just bookmarks, or, <laughs> yeah. you yeah. know, like so they, they had an internet cable and nobody had a yeah. smartphone. Yeah, you know, they might've been able to do some word processing, but they weren't getting anything out to anybody. Yeah. Um, so we did our school, we did the junior high, we got back to Gander Academy around 8.30. This is still September 11th and all the furniture was stacked. They'd already done that. There's about a hundred volunteers in the building, teachers, retired teachers, substitute teachers, spouses that were dragged along, uh, parents of students. 
there was food coming nonstop. There was bedding coming nonstop, all from the community. And These were people who just sort of self-appointed themselves to make yeah, and I was I was a long time before I understood how it all happened. And it was actually our local radio station and our local television cable news, uh, cable community channel. And they would go online and say, this school needs this and this church hall needs that. And um, again, it's it's represented in the musical really well, but it is very accurate. And But me in the school, in that bubble of Gander Academy, I had no awareness of that. My whole five days ended up really being in the school and the functioning daily of how the building worked, how the intercom worked, communications with passengers. But by 10 o'clock, we were ready to go. No passengers. Huh. After midnight, the first bus arrived and the buses kept coming. And by the morning, we had 770 people sleeping on the floor at Gander Academy. There was approximately 6,700 that landed. So we had more than 10% of the population that landed that day. They were from all over the world. They were two German flights, a Belgian flight, and um, a Virgin Atlantic flight. But these were also connecting flights. So they may have taken a flight from another country to get to Frankfurt to get that flight to come on to wherever they were going. Phones were set up. And an example of people traveling, this gentleman comes up and we had books of flags and globe and maps so they could tell us which country. Hmm. And he said, Swiss. So we double checked. It was Switzerland. He gave me a phone number. I went through the operator so we wouldn't have to get an operator that spoke their language. And um, and teachers did this all night long on a phone. There's just oh. a steady lineup, 770 people trying to reach home. Well, so, everyone, the whole world's in turmoil. If you had yes. a person on a plane, you didn't, for, for a long time, the emergency broadcast system told us, hours later, there were still 11 planes unaccounted for. So yeah. We, and Four and even the planes that landed in Gander, they didn't know who might be on them or right. what might be on them. So there was such a, a lack of information, which is hard to imagine now in our enormous instant information world we live in now, only 20 years later. But yeah. these people were trying to tell their families. That I they were still alive. <laughs> right. Yeah. right. Where they were, and most of them still had no grasp of where they were. So this man phoned Switzerland and got no answer. And I said, I'm sorry, there's there's no answer. The un universal hand language, right? Yeah. And he said, no, that's okay. And an hour and a half later, he's in front of me again. And I said, Swiss? Mm -hmm. And he said, no, Brazil. Oh. So his extremities of his people he was reaching were Switzerland to Brazil. Wow. Uh, because I could speak French, I could eavesdrop. There was this lady from Monaco phoning home talking about the cakes and cookies that we were serving them. <laughs> and that she didn't know that people still knew how to bake like that. Oh. There were people, um, a lot of people, if they had a cell phone, you couldn't make collect calls on cell phones. Mm -hmm. And they didn't have minutes for outside of countries. Um, a lot of them didn't have address books and didn't have, you know, they, they, at that point you still could program numbers in your phone at home. So you could get number two and call grandma. But if you were traveling and you were traumatized, you might not be sure what number to call. Then of course there were so many communication lines down. So the big thing that first night really was the communication. Our phone company came in as part of the emergency measure plan and installed extra phone lines. I had five people at my house using my telephone back across the road to the school. And there was four or five more phone lines installed while we had been sitting in the house. So my time was then better used staying at the school. There was almost 800 people there. Me taking three or four out was not going to fix the problem, but at the school, I was able to help with communication, help with translation. Um, and it just went on for days. I went to work as a teacher on September 11th. I was ordered out of the building 72 hours later. Our vice principal came in and said, who's been here since the beginning? And I was not the only one in the office who had been there since the beginning. We were running on adrenaline. We told him we were fine. And... Um, so we um, 
we were ordered out of the building. We were told to go home and sleep and uh, and that we could come back, but that if we got sick, we were of no good, no use to them. So, yeah. And yeah. sleep is important. Now, I've been curious ever since I saw that uh, that play, were the reactions of the, of the flight attendants different from the reactions of the passengers? Did you have a, I often wondered if the people who go through all that professional training, you know, you think a flight attendant is great because they bring you, um, they bring you your salsa water or whatever, but what they're really doing is securing the safety of that plane. Yeah. So they go through a lot of training to say, okay, this bad thing might happen, that bad thing might happen, you need to be prepared. Passengers don't get that training. No. So did you have an ability to sort of tell the difference between people on the planes who were just a basket case and were there others or was everybody just puffing it out? Um, we didn't see a lot of the flight crews. The flight crews ended up getting the hotel rooms and that was part of the requirement for them to have rest to be able to fly again. Huh. But I do know from the stories that have been recounted over the years that Generally, each pilot was given the option as to what and how they would tell their passengers. So when um, my Zoom just got crashed again. Oh. Um, so one of the, the pilots that I worked closely with was the Virgin Atlantic pilot. And he came to the school on the second day and introduced himself. I had an email from him today, Captain Robert Burgess. And he introduced himself and he said, I want to speak to my passengers. So we gathered them. And the conversation that you see with Beverly Bass in the musical is very much the conversation that he had in that room. He reassured them. He told them that they were safe where they were and that their tickets hit Dulles, Washington, and that when they got to take off, that was where he was going to take them. But that if the American airspace remained closed, or if it closed during the flight, he would have to take them back to London and then Virgin would take care of them and get them wherever they needed to be because they understood that their circumstances had changed. So he was very reassuring and he showed up the second day. And I think probably for the flight crews, for the, for the uh, flight attendants and whatnot, I think it would have depended a lot on their experience, on their captain, probably on the group they were working with. Captain Burgess told me that there were people who like that day was their first day working. Wow. Yeah. Who, never, who, never, who never went back. Wow. Who never went back, including wow. pilots. So um, it changed that whole industry. It yeah. changed then how security and how things happened at airports and whatnot too. But um they were, I heard someone speak last night who was a flight attendant and she said, you know, we were the first responders as far as the planes came, right? right. They were, they were the ones who were, you know, when they got word, they were going through the aircraft looking for anything suspicious. Right, right. Because these, these people, um, everybody's learning at the same time. And I imagine that includes the flight attendants that, you know, some really bad things have happened in several planes make sure it doesn't happen in yours. Yeah. Right? That's, that's yeah. the job. Make yeah. sure it doesn't happen. Yeah. 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 Basically announcements of, you know, uh, be aware of attempts to get into the cockpit. Mm. Yeah. Right? So um, this was, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm sure of, there are people who live, yourself included, with such an enormous role on that day who are feeling 10 times what I'm feeling right now, which is just sort of heightened anxiety as we remember back, right? We remember back that, that day, remember the fear. I remember when I finally got home at the end of the night of my first day, my two um, middle school aged kids just wanting me to explain it to them. Yep. And I didn't have an explanation and wishing my mother was alive for the 9,000th time since she passed so she could explain it to me. Cause yep. it was, un but then we flash forward to today and you watch the, um, you know, now with everybody with a smartphone in their hand, the videos of people ha having a fist fight on an airplane because they won't put a mask on. You know, I, there was none of that for you, right? You had thousands of passengers that were completely inconvenienced and everybody, they, what, what once, was it? Once they had that phone call, especially, 
they they calmed so much. They were exhausted when they got in. They'd been on the aircraft, all of them, for 24 hours, for sure, some of them more. Wow. Once they got a phone call and made a contact and maybe got a couple hours sleep and woke up and realized there was food every place you looked. They were not going to go hungry in Gander. Um, things settled. I remember one woman wanting to know where the military was. And I asked her if she needed something. I spent pretty much all of my time in the office, kind of fielding questions and helping with communication and stuff. And um, so I kept asking her if there was something that she needed. Like I couldn't understand her need to find the military. And she finally looked at me and she said, who is telling you what to do? Huh. And this is a group of primary teachers and we kind of looked at each other and it's like, we're just do, like doing what we think needs to be done. Is there something that you need? And all of a sudden she was shocked. She just, it, it just, she was looking for a chain of command and, and she just couldn't imagine that we were just, like I said, we're, we're teachers in the school. Is there something that you need? And she just couldn't imagine that the teachers in the school were taking care of all of these people. Um, you know, that is an interesting thing about you, though, because I interviewed you two or three years ago. I don't know when it was anymore um, about the work that you're doing with Syrian refugees, which we are going to talk about in a minute. By the way, this is Diane Davis. If you've seen Come From Away, she is one of the amazing people of that community that's featured in that Broadway play about how a small town in Gander, Newfoundland, turned into the welcome wagon for a, a thousands of tragically misplaced people on the day that uh, that America stood still as uh, as country Western musicians like to call it. Yeah. Um, Alan Jackson, I think. But um, when I asked you why you were doing this for, for Syrian refugees, why the tiny town of Gander, Newfoundland had actually taken in more Syrian refugees than all of the United States of America, um, which by the way, shame on the United States of America. But, but the the you said to me, and it was one of the first lines of the um, of the story that we're just doing what our grandmothers would have wanted us to do, or do, uh, treating people the way our grandmothers treated people. And and so you had this generational voice in your head sitting in that office with this woman who wanted a chain of command, saying, "My chain of command is we're good people, we do good things." Uh, my uncle used to joke about my grandmother that she only cooked one meal a day. It starts around six thirty in the morning. <laughs> It just goes all day. And and yeah, I mean, I grew up in in generations of people where somebody came in at meal time, you pulled out a couple more chairs and you put down a couple more plates. And um, my mom just loved talking to strangers, and I've I've certainly caught that from her. And wondering where people are from and learning about them. And she worked in tourism and. And she liked taking care of people and she liked especially taking care of little kids. And, uh, you know, one of the ironies of this is, is that September 11th was her birthday. And okay. she said, you know, I'll never forget that birthday. And then she got Alzheimer's. So she did forget that birthday. But what we did on September 11th as a community um, and as individuals was nothing beyond our means. We did nothing beyond our means. We shared bedding out of the linen closets. We shared some groceries and food out of the fridge, out of the freezer. Uh, some people might have gone to the store and bought some extra stuff that they could afford. We gave away coats and boots and hats. Uh, if you met some cute kid, you were back to the house to look for some toys. No one afterwards talked about what they gave away or what they lost or what they missed from having taken care of these people. The other thing to remember is these, these passengers landed in Gander. More than half of them stayed in the communities of Glenwood, Appleton, Lewisport, Norris Arm, and Gambo, which are even smaller communities than Gander. So Gander kept about half, a little less than half. And then they went out to these other surrounding communities. Then more surrounding communities it's like it's like a, a solar system going out yeah. all these stars miles and miles away in church halls and fire halls and and schools were gathering together they were cooking food they were loading it in trucks and it was being driven an hour two hours 
three hours to gander. In Millertown, four hours away, it was done like a garbage collection. You put non-perishable food and clean bedding in boxes at the end of the driveway, and trucks went through just like a garbage collection, grabbed it all, and drove it four hours to Gander. And this went on for days. Wow. And you had other problems. Um, we're just going to talk about five more minutes about yeah. uh, how you guys handled 9-11, and then I want to move to what you're doing now for uh, refugees um, in Syria, but from Syria. Uh, but these people couldn't access their luggage. No. So so they might have had hats, boots, and shirts and things on their luggage, but nobody knew what was in those airplanes. Right. So they couldn't, I mean, there could be, a, the fear was there's a bad guy on this plane who's now in Gander, and that bad guy's going to access the plane and blow it up from whatever they have yeah. in their cargo hold. So so you these people, even if they had insulin or... Right. Some other life-saving medicine, they couldn't access it. They um, actually set up um, a mobile hospital in Gander Academy. That first night, there was um, nurses and a doctor there, and they were kind of doing triage and, uh, you know, getting people medications, and, and the pharmacies were open 24 hours. Nobody was charged for anything. Wow. Welcome they to Canada. Landed in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> so the other thing that the other thing in that play that's so remarkable uh, is the veterinarian, right? Because there are animals yeah. on the planes, and the animals couldn't get off the planes. Yeah. So she was actually the the head of the SPCA, or the it would be a ASPCA, I guess, uh, down your way. And she um, she phoned up and she said, you know, are there any animals on the plane? No, no animals on the plane. So she checked with the local vet and he said, no, I've checked. And they said, there's no animals on the plane. But see, her husband worked at the airport. So she checked with him and it's like, oh yeah, I'm pretty sure there's probably some animals. So long story short, she found a whole bunch of dogs, a cat that was epileptic, uh, two rare chimpanzees on their way to the Cleveland Zoo. Wow. And you know, made the right phone calls again to the vet and public health and whatnot, had these animals removed so that she could uh, she could take care of them. So if she had just taken no for an answer, they would have starved to death. Oh, yeah, they would have perished and they would have perished in the in the heat. Uh, it was record setting temperatures in Gander too. So uh, yeah, my little guy's gonna just uh, just one second. You keep talking. I'm right here. All right. So um, I had the marvelous honor of meeting this excellent grandmother who, uh, because she, uh, Gander was, this is a couple of years ago when we stopped, uh, there was a certain political um, agenda that was being advanced in the United States, not to take, oh my God, you are so beautiful. <laughs> not to take refugees from certain uh, Muslim nations, which ended up being unconstitutional, thank God. Uh, the, for the court system, but still no refugees, no Syrian refugees were taken in the United States, literally for years. Um, and uh, Gander, this this town that opened its arms to thousands of people at once, um, and I remember interviewing you for the story I did for Common Dreams, and we'll post that, um, you know, underneath in the YouTube or the Facebook if you're watching right now. Also, if you have any questions for uh, Diane, uh, you can post them on Facebook or YouTube, and we'll try and make sure that we ask them before we're done here. You have about 20 minutes to get those questions in. Um, but when I was uh, talking to you uh, about what you folks were doing and how you were bringing people in, you explained what is, what is really common now in the United States, which is there are communities all across the United States, and I imagine Canada, where the population is sort of a little short on different kinds of laborers. I mean, we certainly have a worker shortage right now in the United States where pretty much every bar and restaurant is hiring. Uh, the service industry it doesn't have enough people. Um, and you were talking about how you saw refugees as sort of pumping new life into the into the community. And you your community was excited for the Syrians who were fleeing for a, a better, safer life. Um, do you want to tell us a little about the program? Yeah, we. Um, I saw an announcement on our local cable channel that there was going to be a meeting of people interested in the possibility of sponsoring Syrian refugees. And this was just after a worldwide story of a young child who drowned 
Um, he was a refugee child and he drowned. There's a picture of his father picking him up off the beach. And that child had family in Canada. And if they had have had a sponsor and a safe way to get to Canada, that child never would have died. And so I think that was the catalyst for most people in my group. I went to the meeting that was announced. Uh, I was one of the few, I think, that went to that meeting as an individual. Many oh. were representative of their um, church or community group, um, maybe somebody from Rotary or from a Lions Club or from a certain... Uh, just different, usually affiliated to something. I kind of went as Diane Davis, wondering what the heck's on the go. And um, we formed a committee, a Gander Refugee Outreach, and we did some research. And I basically took on the role of social media and putting the word out and spe spreading good news stories. Uh, and again, correcting disinformation. Um, within a month and a half, two months, we had money in the bank to sponsor our first families. Wow. The community came together. Um, the United, uh, the Anglican Church, the whole diocese got involved. The United Church, uh, the Baptist Church, uh, pretty much every denomination was involved. Various service groups individuals. Uh, one of the doctors in Gander had been involved uh, as a child. Her family sponsored boat people. And she remembered this experience. And her father is still very good friends with this man who he sponsored. So she hit up all of the, shut the door, crying baby out. Um, she, um, she hit up all the, the medical community and pulled money out of them. And sometimes when you don't have time to do something, you can throw money at it, just like, right. just like the pickle jar. Yeah. And uh, we had the money in no time. Then it was the process, the waiting and whatnot. And um, in order to be sponsored, a family must be a refugee and must be designated refugee by the United Nations, first of all. So they have to go through that process. Then they get put in the long list of potential people to get sponsored. And if they're lucky, their number comes up and they get to come. So we were, um, we started in 2015 before Christmas and our first family arrived. I retired on June 24th and our first family arrived on June 29th. So I had a four day June retirement. Fourth, what year? Pardon? What year? June oh, 2016. Yeah, so our, exactly 15 years after you yeah. rescued all these people on the plane. Yeah. yeah. So we had a committee. We had a, a fairly active committee and some supporters, and we had a plan. Um, most of it worked. Uh, you know, my, my plan, my role, I thought, was going to be to help with school uh, because I was a retired teacher. I had no idea how many doctor's appointments and dentist appointments families would need when they have been seven years as refugees without medical attention. Um, you know, someone had to teach them how to drive, uh, someone else had to teach them the, the vocabulary and stuff, then to pass the test to be able to learn to drive. Um, it, it just, it went on and on and on. Uh, today, because I have had a busy day, I just went to a restaurant and picked up a donair. And um, the the father of the first family is still working there six years later. Huh. And uh, he said, you know, I've got my, my uh, ceremony, my citizenship ceremony on Wednesday. So huh. he's finally going to be a Canadian. He passed his test in the spring, but because of delays, he's got to wait to actually swear his oath. So he will get to go online and hold up his permanent residency card to be identified by the computer and his swear his oath. And then he gets to cut up his residency card and okay. he gets to do that for his three children too, because they will now also be Canadian. Wonderful. Citizens. And he ha does have a Canadian. He'll he be does have a Canadian. Family. He does have a Canadian. Because they had a new baby since they came. Yeah. And she's, she's starting... 
uh, kinder start this year. Uh, wow. Like it's it's just amazing to watch these children grow up. Yeah. One family has left Gander. There's always this um, myth that they come here and they go. And all of our families stayed here for uh, five years. And one family has just moved from Gander. And that was always their plan that when their daughter went to university, they would go with her. So she and her family have moved to St. John's. They're still in Newfoundland. And she's doing a math and science degree at Memorial University of Newfoundland. And I suspect someday she'll be a doctor. Wow. What a w wonderful asset you've brought. And so I imagine there are some days when you feel like, um, I don't know, you know, it's just, a, you know, maybe the day's not going great. And then you do ever take stock and in inventory of your life and say, well, maybe I'll just go watch my Broadway play. <laughs> <laughs> or I'll think about that family that is not in a refugee camp or those five families that are not in refugee camps during a pandemic. They're safe in homes in Gander. And I had I had the opportunity to interview um, the father who was about to become his, uh, 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 get his card. Um, and I'm writing a book on food insecurity. And so he was telling me some remarkable stories. And one of the stories he told me is obviously when you're a refugee, you haven't brought everyone you know. You haven't yeah. brought everyone you love and you haven't brought everyone you care about to safety. You've done the bare minimum to protect yourself and your immediate family. And so your heart and your mind are always back home where you know life is still terrible. Yep. And uh, he, this is terrible, this is upsetting me. He told me the stories of the only places during the pandemic in Syria that have had any amount of food are the hospitals. Mm. And so his loved ones that are back in Syria are picking the trash at the hospital to see what food has been thrown away. Yep. And they are eating food discarded from a hospital with COVID. Yeah. And we have, we have no idea. We have no idea of what these, these people have seen, of what these children saw and remember before they came here. We have no idea. And it's, it's so encouraging to see them here and see everything that's going on. But every time there's a birthday and they post one of the kids' birthdays, you see all of these messages come up in Arabic and you realize all of these people who have been lost from them that they may never see again. Yes. And that's not counting those who have died in the war, who've died of illness or who've died because they couldn't get, uh, you know, in Syria, you, if you're in the hospital, you've got to pay for the hospital. And if you can't pay for the hospital when you're discharged, you go to prison. Right. So that's why there's food in the hospitals. That's right. where people can pay for it. Right. But it is, it's, it's very difficult. One, one of the Syrian ladies actually next weekend, um, friends of mine have a, um, a hotel, small hotel in Newfoundland, and they invited all the Syrian families for a weekend. And uh, we went and had a really good time. And this has become an annual event. They host the Syrian families. And they've gotten so involved that they have now decided to sponsor their own Syrian family. Oh. They're going to be private sponsors. They've met a family online and um, they are going to sponsor a Syrian family. And one of my Syrian ladies here is going to their hotel next week and going to prepare this amazing Syrian feast. Mm -hmm. And they're doing a weekend where you pay for two nights accommodation and eat Syrian food and your meals are all included. And it's a fundraiser to bring help to bring another Syrian family to Newfoundland. That's great. If you can get uh, me details for that, I'll share that. Yes, uh, there's a there's a GoFundMe. Maybe people would even consider making a little donation to. Help we make were, faster. Uh, Max, the producer, is being really wonderful, and Max says there are a bunch of comments for us that we'll be reading shortly. But um, Max will post things like the GoFundMe. Um, is this the same GoFundMe that you hooked me up with? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, and I was really excited about that. I, I mean, I still, I feel exactly like the hundreds or thousands of people who reached out to me and helped you who contacted and said, what can I do to help? Oh, back on, uh, in 2001, 
I feel the same need to help to commemorate this holiday of, well, not holiday, to commemorate this Memorial Day uh, when we when we remember the lives lost in Brazil and DC and, and New York and the sacrifice and the goodness that was exposed, all the, all the greatness we've seen. One of the stories that I'm, I have a book, um, it's still left out in America, State of the United States, uh, and this is a 15 year catch up from 2004 when I ran for vice president of the United States. And I, that's such a weird sentence, I have to race through it. When I ran for vice president of the United States and I lived in homeless shelters across the country because I had a slight uh, hint I might not win. <laughs> I did lose by 50, 53 million votes. The man who shot his friend in the face though, and that hurt my feelings. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I interviewed, I, I slept on the street in New York City and, and slept in shelters and during my campaign. Um, and I met people who knew folks who had lived on the street around the World Trade Center. So if you go to large cities in the United States, I'm not sure about Canada, but um, in the United States, you'll see people that just live on the street. One of the great tragedies is when the buildings came down and when the, when the disaster and the, and the violence happened, many homeless people were killed. Many people who were living on the sidewalk or in an alley were killed, but they were not counted. Okay. They are not on the official role. And, and the two homeless people who are my homeless guides when I lived in uh, New York City during the campaign for vice president, um, it, three years later, they still had never heard from their friends since September 11th, 2001. And it's just so easy. The, 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 the enormous loss is so great that it's so easy not to know the actual size of it. And that it still goes on. We, um, we don't have an appreciation until we know someone who is still suffering the physical and emotional illnesses that came from being a first responder or from even just from living nearby. And I went to a memorial service this morning and we went to the memorial service in Appleton, Newfoundland. It's uh, about a half hour drive from here. They have done a memorial every year since 9-11. They house passengers. Last year was the only year that they didn't do a service because of COVID. Mm -hmm. And I wore my O'Hara's New York t-shirt that's got the towers on the back and says, we will remember. And a gentleman saw the shirt and he said, uh, O'Hara's, are you from New York? And I said, no, but I've had a beer at O'Hara's. <laughs> and I asked him where he's from. And he said, oh, he said, uh, I live in Florida now, but I used to live in New York. So I knew. And I said, so so where were you? We we're at a service memorial of 9-11. I said, so where were you on 9-11? He said, I was in the subway under the towers. Oh, my gosh. So there are so many people and they come here, they come here on a pilgrimage almost. Mm -hmm. And some of them come still kind of hoping to find good people. Mm -hmm. Some come skeptical thinking, no, it couldn't have happened that way. And we screech them in and give them rides and do things for them just to like really mess them up and send them back. Not Newfoundland screech. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> but people, people really need human contact. They really need to meet real people who are kind. And that's what we've come to represent to them. I'm not always really well behaved, but uh, I try to be most times. Um, but for me, the experience was also meeting real people who responded that day. Yeah. And we have a mutual friend who is a responder. Um, I have a number of other friends who, who were first responders or survivors on that day. And so for me, I'm very proud of what my community and what my region did. You can't help but be proud of it. Yeah. And it's amazing that they fly me all over the world and I get to watch Come From Away. <laughs> right. But I wouldn't miss any of that if those towers were still there. Right. Right, we'd all give up everything. If, if we could do, people. yeah, if we could put those towers and those people back. Right. So, you know, it's a it's a mixed 
anniversary. It's it's knowing my friends have counted it down, counted down, counted down, getting to it, and they're now reliving it and thinking about all the people that they've lost and all the people that are still sick. And, uh, you know, then we've got other people coming just, you know, wanting us to screech them in. <laughs> so, Well, I do think it's, it is, uh, I mean, I understand it completely. I reached out to you for the exact same reason. I wanted hope to be a part of my day. I wanted hope to be a part of my memory. I, I, uh, I can pay you the finest compliment. I think I can pay anyone, which is my mother would have loved you. Yeah. You know, my mother would have, I, I wish she was there to talk to, but I, I know that if my mother had thought that Diane Davis is out there in the world, she'd have been really pretty happy because you're exactly the kind of, of human we all need to talk to and hear from today to know that, um, you know, A, really good stuff happened and B, look how easy it is. And that's the thing. And it is easy. And, and I'm very fortunate. You know, it was, it was well modeled to me growing up by my mom, how to take care of people and how to be nice to people and certainly how to feed people. And the, my big takeaway from all of this is that I've learned through the process, through a couple of experiences in relationship to this, that I need to get better at accepting the kindness of others. I've had a couple of experiences, both in New York City, where I turned someone down who wanted to do something nice for me. And, you know, it wasn't like one gentleman that we'd met on the street, we got him to take our picture. And long story short, we chatted and he wanted us to come home for supper. And he boasted about what a good cook his wife was. And I didn't want to bother her and I didn't want to bother him. And I turned it down. And, um, 10 minutes later, I realized that was the biggest mistake I've made today. I would have made a friend out of him. We would have probably had really good food. And if we didn't have really good food, we still would have been fine. And we would have heard stories from people who were there and we would have gotten their impression of it. We would have got a chance to tell our story. And the only reason that I don't have those two people as friends now is because I said no and took away his opportunity for kindness. So my big takeaway from this is when someone offers to do something for me now, I'm getting much better at saying, thank you. That's very nice. Yeah. So I that they can have the experience. I think it is important to, uh, to understand that uh, kindness is, an, is, a, is self-expression. And, yes. and you, what you did for thousands of people in Gander that week was in a total expression of you and your community. And and the people on those stairs coming down the stairs said, we got to let her do this because otherwise she'll be back to do something. <laughs> you know, they got that this was this was the language, the love language of Diane Davis, and we better let her speak, right? Yeah. And that is really important. And so we're going to give people a, two chances to voice their love language. So you have um, this GoFundMe project. Um, that they can send $5 and thank you, Max, for popping it up there. There's the GoFundMe link. We'll also put it as like a hot link underneath this so you can just click on it. But if you can write that down from Syria to Newfoundland, I'm sure you can search that in the GoFundMe site too. Um, so that's one opportunity. $5 is not too little to put on that because if 100 other people put five bucks in, then you've got 500. Um, but then also in um, Pennsylvania, in central Pennsylvania on December 21st, if you're a knitter or a crocheter um, or someone who wants to help us um, get some printing done and pay the insurance costs and stuff, we are making a 250 panel blanket for a homeless remembrance night. It's the longest night of the year, December 21st, the beginning of winter. It's, it's uh, traditionally the night that we remember people who, if you live on the street, sadly you also die on the street like the people who have been forgotten on 9-11 that died that day. Um, and the next day when we disassemble this blanket uh, made of 250 panels of homemade love filled blankets, we're going to distribute them to people who need a blanket. Um, so folks can, uh, we'll get more information out underneath this, but folks can be a part of the Homeless Remembrance Blanket Project. It is on, uh, on Facebook um, and go to just join the group so you can see the blankets people are making. I mean, some of these blankets are so beautiful. And someone said to me, you should be auctioning these blankets. They're, they're too beautiful, you know, too beautiful. I'm trying to get my fingers in the thing. Um, 
but they are too beautiful. Why shouldn't someone who has nothing have a beautiful blanket? So we're going to do that. That's, that's that. another example of someone doing something that's totally within their means mm -hmm. to knit or crochet a, a, a blanket for somebody. We had a woman reach out to us from a, um, she's in a, she's kind of a shut in in a elder home. And she said, I can't do anything, but I can knit if you can get me yarn. Yep. And so I started giving people her name and which home she was in. And a couple of weeks later on Facebook, I got a message, stop with the yarn. <laughs> <laughs> Enough yarn. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, these are the little, and, and if, if one of these two little things doesn't appeal to you, Find your own little thing. There are a million things you can do to be good to people. Absolutely. Um, we have, we're out, we're actually over time, but real quick before we say goodbye, you wanted to just mention something about Afghanistan. Yeah, I think, um, you know, my group was focused on the Syrian refugees at the time. There's a lot of talk and, and pictures of everything that's going on in Afghanistan right now. And these refugees too need help and support and someone to help them to resettle. My Syrian friends were all working within three to six months of arriving, whether they spoke English or not. They're still all still working in the same jobs that they got when they came to Gander. Their employers are very happy to have them. And if I could bring in that many more people working as hard as they could, I could get them jobs instantly. If you are legitimately concerned about the people in Afghanistan and those who didn't get out, do something about helping the people who did get out. Help them to resettle so that maybe they can sponsor some family members down the way. Yes, put pressure on in the right places to get more people brought out. But I seriously suspect that many of the people making noise about Afghanistan in Canada and the US and how the e exit was done are not lining up to help support the people who did get out. And the rest of us are gonna to have to do that too. Right, so you got a lot on your plate, my friend. And a grandbaby who didn't talk not once while he was on the camera. So oh. we got to teach him a few more words. <laughs> well, luckily <laughs> he's so cute, he doesn't need any words. So. No, no, he just makes an appearance. Yeah. Um, I guess um, Max, yes, has put the GoFundMe link. When we're going to put that down below. I'm just reading the notes real quick to make sure we say everything before um, before we're done. Yeah, it's wonderful. And Chris and Aaron Davis and everyone who's made kind comments, we love you too and we appreciate you. And we appreciate everybody right now in whatever stage of commemoration or mourning they're experiencing on 9-11. On and Diane Davis is here to, to say, if it makes you feel better to help other people feel better. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do give to the hurts. Right? And if you can't give, if you can't physically, COVID's got me very restricted in what I feel comfortable doing, still throw money at it when I can. And every $5 makes a difference. You think about all the small efforts, a dozen biscuits made in a home carried into a school by two dozen women was an awful lot of biscuits. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to get to Gander someday. Uh, you get the 50 cent tour and I'll give it to you half price. Okay. <laughs> I'll be saving that quarter. All, all right. right. Thank you so much for your time. Thank, Thank you for you all your for doing invitation. to make the world a better place. I just I love you and appreciate you. You too. Take care. Bye. -bye. Right. So uh, I don't know when we're going to do another one of these, but I don't think we'll top this one. So <laughs> we get, we get awards or something, then we'll have to think about it. Right. Thanks, Max Donnelly. Max Donnelly, the producer of the show did an, a usual, a fantastic, fantastic job. So thanks Max. That's off. Have a great day, Diane. You too. Bye-bye.